Hello everyone, it's Wednesday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. North Korea has been building up provocations more than ever while Washington and Seoul show their firepower through a variety of joint military exercises. The regime has not just limited its provocations to firing missiles and testing nuclear-capable underwater weapon systems, but also showed Kim Jong-un's strong willingness to strengthen the regime's nuclear force by urging officials for flawless preparations to use nuclear weapons anytime and anywhere. For an in-depth analysis of the tensions on the peninsula, we welcome into the studio Dr. Ko Myung-hyun, Senior Fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Dr. Go, welcome and thank you for your time. Good to be here. And we also have Bruce Klinger on the line, Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Klinger, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. All right. Now, first question to our mm. uh, Dr. Go. Let's tap into the latest issue, mm. shall we? Uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un urged uh, expanding the production of mm. weapons-grade nuclear materials mm. for an exponential increase in mm. its nuclear arsenal. Mm. And Kim also, like I said before, mm. called for flawless preparations to use nuclear weapons anytime and anywhere. Mm. I mean, this is a clear show of will to strengthen the regime's nuclear force, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So this is something that, uh, that I would say is adding flesh to the, to the bone or the details. This is something that we have known or speculated for a long time. So in the, our overall threat perception of North Korea's nuclear capability, as well as North Korea's nuclear capability, haven't changed at all because it's, since its revelation. What I mean by this is that the experts as well as the policymakers have known for a while that the North Korea had these kind of systems in place, such mm. as the you know, overall com comprehensive nuclear management system, mm -hmm. their capability to uh, detonate a uh, nuclear warhead, uh, and, you know, Airbus move. Uh, mm -hmm. So those are all things that uh, we speculated with high certainty that North Korea possessed already. What North mm -hmm. Korea is doing right now is essentially demonstrating that they indeed have these capabilities. So this is more of a PR exercise, I would say, rather than a uh, material increase in North Korea's threat level. So the, the, the question then is why North Korea is doing this? So what North Korea is doing right now is essentially engaged in a propaganda campaign mm -hmm. to show, first of all, that uh, they, can, they have the capability to match uh, or even surpass the, the U.S. or ROK combined military capability, uh, you know, using the occasion of the joint military drills. And I suspect the second motivation behind this uh, you know, information campaign by North Korea is internal, is to address the North Korean people, mm -hmm. uh, telling them that uh, North Korea, despite all the major economic sacrifices that the population have been subject to in the last three or four years, uh, their nuclear capability and the military capabilities have been increasing. So this, uh, this is the reason why I think North Korea is upping the, the noise, I would say, uh, regarding their nuclear capabilities. Right, so it's part of a propaganda and also it's to reassure people in the regime. Right, now Mr. Klinger, the North uh, state media also released photos of Kim Jong-un inspecting tactical nuclear warheads called Hwasan-31 for the first time. And some say this could hint at the possibility of Pyongyang conducting a seventh nuclear test in the near future. What are your thoughts on this? Well, well I agree. Uh, it's actually been a year now that uh, Washington and Seoul have been saying that a seventh nuclear test is, is imminent and that all preparations have been completed. Uh, but as experts have pointed out is that uh, North Korea first uh, revealed through photos of the, the North Korean leader with nuclear weapons prior to doing previous nuclear tests. So this may be sort of the final step, uh, preparatory step by North Korea before they do the expected seventh nuclear test. And that would be of a small tactical nuclear warhead, which they've been emphasizing uh, in their commentary for the last two years or so. And, and all of it is a way of trying to deter the U.S. and South Korea from attacking them. Of course, we we have not attacked them even when they did not have nuclear weapons. Uh, but this is North Korea's justification for developing these weapons. And I was part of a study last year by the RAND Corporation where we predicted that they could have 200 nuclear warheads by 2027. So it's all part of a way of revealing and then demonstrating their capabilities. And we've seen lots of missile launches uh, since the collapse of the summitry with the U.S. in 2019. Uh, and then this is a, their way of demonstrating their nuclear capabilities. And then for the naysayers who, who might say, well, that hasn't proved that they actually have these new generations of, of tactical nuclear warheads, that's when we may start seeing, where we might see the seventh test. 
Right, I see. Now, uh, Dr. Go, North Korea fired two mm. short-range ballistic missiles off to the East Sea uh, mm. on Monday, and Pyongyang said it detonated a mock nuclear warhead mm. 500 meters above a targeted mm. island. And what significance does this have? And the series of provocations, they are mainly due to increased dual military drills and exercises by uh, Seoul and Washington allies, right? So that's exactly the impression that North Korea wants the, the international community to have. Mm. The idea that uh, the reason why they are engaged in this kind of provocative actions, which is very uh, threatening to the stability in the region, is due to the joint military exercises uh, held by the United States and mm -hmm. South Korea. And the reason why they are engaged in this uh, in a communication exercise, I would say, is because North Korea's strategy is very much lies on establishing this firm equivalence between their illicit missile and nuclear development sanctioned by the United Nations for doing mm -hmm. so, and the very much defensive nature of the <coughs> joint military exercises carried out regularly by the United States and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And it's been, a, uh, it's been a long standing North Korean position that uh, the two are equivalent, even though one is totally illegal, the other one is not. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, in order to ensure that the, the South Korea and the United States feel compelled to suspend this very much necessary uh, military military exercises. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, the, you know, the China, for instance, supports this position by North Korea. That's why the Chinese have used the, uh, the term dual suspension in order to advance and, uh, the negotiation with North Korea. Dual suspension meaning North Korea would suspend uh, the testing of their missiles and even the nuclear uh, devices in exchange for the United States and South Korea suspending the joint military drills. Mm -hmm. so, this is a, overall a strategic signaling exercise by North Korea. And, and I think there's a reason why Seoul and Washington keep insisting on having these joint military drills is to essentially uh, you know, counter this uh, wrong message coming from Pyongyang that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know, the very much defensive exor nature of these exercises are being attacked uh, by the North Koreans through their provocations. So, uh, I, I mean, the, this is going to be a seasonal, uh, a seasonal kind of a phenomena going on every year because North Korea will insist on doing this every time the United States and South Korea have these uh, joint military drills. But that doesn't mean that we should forget about the illegal nature of North Korean mm -hmm. provocations. Right, right. Now, uh, Mr. Klinger, among the recent provocations, the regime's test of an underwater nuclear attack drone took South Korea by surprise. And according to the KCNA, this underwater drone is called Hail and can stealthily go into operational waters and destroy enemy warships by creating superpower radioactive tidal waves with an explosion. Now, that's as far as I know. Now, could you explain to us what this really is and how threatening this could be? North Korea has said that it uh, has tested this system dozens of times, but at least outside of government, this is really the first indication uh, we've had of this weapon system. Uh, and I think people have focused on the, the sort of propaganda claim of a, of a radioactive tsunami. But uh, I think what we need to focus is on is clearly they've developed an underwater drone uh, with a warhead, sort of a, a lingering or loitering torpedo, which can travel out to 500 or 600 kilometers, as they claim, uh, or can loiter in waters waiting for allied ships to, to pass nearby. Uh, and they, they clearly have demonstrated that capability. And whether it's nuclear capable, it, it very well could be. Uh, they've demonstrated or claim that they have this new generation of very small tactical warheads. Now, whether it can create a radioactive tsunami, I think that's much more in doubt. But uh, from previous U.S. underwater nuclear explosions decades ago, we could see that it does create, you know, quite a a uh, explosion. Uh, but I don't think it's something that will inundate the, the shores of South Korea or Japan. But the, really, the focus, I think, should be on yet another threat to allied systems, uh, in this case, naval. Right. Now, Dr. Go, contrary to the North's claim that the war had accurately and successfully detonated under the sea, mm. uh, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said such claims are uh, exaggerated and mm. manipulated, like our uh, Mr. Klinger pointed out. And not just this, there were also many other questions mm. about whether Pyongyang had fired a KN-23 uh, solid fuel short-range ballistic missiles from mm. an underground silo, though this also lacked the concrete evidence. Mm. Uh, if they really are just part of deceptions, why is North Korea going to these lengths? No, it's because uh, North Korea wants to essentially uh, 
show in a very short term uh, how capable their military and nuclear ca uh, missile capabilities are. Mm -hmm. And so essentially they are engaged in deception. But, uh, but the more, I think it's more of a more bluffing by North Korea. And I think the reason why they are engaged in bluffing exercises is because North Korea is in a timetable uh, in, in order to essentially compare the United States come to the negotiation table as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. We know that the uh, North Koreans is uh, under dire economic straits. Mm -hmm. And another political constraint they face is that uh, they need to establish some sort of a dialogue with Washington, but then they cannot do it uh, I mean, they kind of start this engagement process from Pyongyang. The usual routine when it comes to North Korean diplomacy is for the outsiders mm -hmm. to establish some sort of bridgehead uh, and then uh, somehow convince North Koreans to uh, more cre uh, create a perception that North Koreans have no other choice but to come out to, uh, uh, for dialogue mm. with either Seoul or Washington mm. as if North Koreans are doing them a favor. Mm. So this element is lacking right now. North Korea doesn't have, a, doesn't have a friendly government either in Seoul or Washington anymore. So, and then they are only subject to strong deterrence measures by the, both, by the two countries. Mm -hmm. So North Koreans are trying to find a way out of this conundrum. Uh, so they need to solve these immediate economic problems and also to establish some sort of engagement uh, uh, mechanism in Washington so that that they can have some sort of uh, uh, like a time horizon, uh, the visibility about their nuclear strategy. Meaning, what I mean by this is that North Korea cannot go on and on that, uh, carrying out provocations forever. They need to have an endpoint. An endpoint has to be a negotiation with the United States. Uh, they don't see that point right now. So in order to establish the visibility to this, they need to establish an engagement process with Washington. But clearly, the Biden administration doesn't seem to be very interested in that. Right. So. The only, so only option left for, left for North Korea is to bluff their mm -hmm. capabilities, uh, you know, increase their threat level, at least the perceived threat level, so that there's some, some sort of an international opinion created uh, so that it uh, pressures both uh, Seoul and Washington to come to the negotiation table. The idea that uh, you should respond, uh, the, the adult in the room, uh, maybe, uh, mainly the South Korea and the United States, should uh, essentially uh, step up and then reach out to Pyongyang to you know, stabilize the situation. So in order to you know, speed up this process, North Korea has to portray themselves as dangerous and then much more threatening than they mm -hmm. really are. Mm -hmm. Right, interesting. So uh, North Korea is doing bluffing uh, to put United States back on the negotiating table. So, so this is more of a diplomatic uh, yeah. uh, uh, instrument rather than a genuine military threat, mm. in my view. Right, interesting. Now, uh, Mr. Klinger, from an underwater nuclear attack drone and long-range strategic cruise missiles to submarine-launched cruise missiles, uh, though, I mean, even if that could be all uh, deceptive moves, North Korea is still facing diversity in its arsenal. Why is this? It's to demonstrate its capabilities, and what we've seen is over the years they've they've revealed either nuclear weapons or or missile systems, uh, and in 2017 uh, they did a very large nuclear test, an ICBM test, which demonstrated they could hit the entire continental United States with nuclear weapons, uh, and then after the collapse of the of the summitry in 2019, they've really had an exponential increase in their their missile launches, and cumulatively, what this is showing is a very diverse, very capable. Uh, nuclear system, which would some cases be nuclear capable, others would be conventional warhead. Uh, and they've shown that they have several different intercontinental ballistic missiles, several different submarine launch ballistic missiles, and then uh, land target missiles of, of all ranges. Uh, and some of these have maneuverable warheads or, or hypersonic gl gliders, which could uh, make it more difficult for allied missile defense systems to intercept. So cumulatively, it's shown a very capable, very dangerous uh, North Korean missile and nuclear capability. Uh, and I think it's useful to point out is that even when the U.S. and South Korea canceled or constrained their, uh, their military exercises uh, for the last four or five years, North Korea continued these missile launches as well as their own large-scale military exercises, the, the winter training cycle, the summer training cycle. Uh, and so that canceling or restraining allied military exercises had no effect on trying to curtail North Korean violations of UN resolutions through missile launches or their own large-scale military exercises. 
Right, I see that's an important point to look at. Uh, Dr. Go, what matters, I believe, is mm. whether South Korea's defense capabilities is uh, very much effective against the North's, you mm. know, diversified nuclear delivery vehicles. Mm. What is your point on this? So I think there are two, two components to any kind of a defense system against uh, the threats such as North Korea's nuclear weapons. And one is uh, the idea of a deterrence by denial, meaning the having a defensive capability to uh, showcase uh, to North Koreans that uh, no matter what kind of attack system they uh, they use, South Korea and the United States can defend ourselves against that. Mm -hmm. And that means that the, uh, the South Koreans should have a detection capability mm -hmm. and also you know, the weapon system to target uh, uh, you know, the attack systems uh, by North Korea. So, so far, South Korea and the United States have been focusing on, uh, on, on, on the more like a mainstream uh, attack uh, instruments by uh, weapon systems by North Korea, such as the ballistic missiles, uh, for which we have the missile defense systems as well as the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the other system that targets North Koreans' uh, missiles before they, are, uh, they lift off from the ground. Mm. So these are the, the, the kill chains and so forth. Uh, so they've been focusing less on a more like, you know, uh, mm. more like unorthodox uh, method of attack such as hail, the, the recently unveiled uh, uh, the submarine, uh, auto autonomous submarine uh, under sea uh, essentially a missile uh, by North Korea. So, but then we have to understand that the, the, we have to understand whether how practical these new systems that North Korean cells in, unveiled are. Mm -hmm. uh, the HAIL system, for instance, uh, it's not clear whether it's a practical system to, to be used in an attack mm -hmm. against, say, like the, the US or South Korean navies. Uh, the reason is because it's not clear whether the North Koreans have the real-time capability to uh, communicate with the HAIL system mm -hmm. to, uh, to go after a moving target. So since North Korea lacks that uh, you know, IS so-called intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance system that allows them to track real-time where the South Korean and American targets are, it's, a li it's, it's, it's unlikely that North Koreans can use them against a uh, moving target. They can only t use it against static targets. Mm -hmm. So that lessens the value of a North Korean system. And it shows that the, how inefficient North Korea's weapons developments are. So, but it doesn't mean they reduce the overall risk to South Korea. So what uh, the second part of defense for why South Korea and the United States is the idea of deterrence by punishment. It means that even if North Korea succeeds in targeting some of our uh, military units or, or the civilian targets, uh, South Korea and the United States can uh, deploy an overwhelming force to respond against North Korean attacks. So essentially, the, the, that's the idea of going after the North Korean leadership. So if the North Korean leadership uh, miscalculates and decides to go after South Korea and the United States, uh, the only outcome that North Korean can expect is the, the end of the regime. And that's been repeated over and over, both by Seoul and the United States. And it's been uh, uh, actually written down in the recently unveiled the national security strategy of the United States. So this is the idea that uh, we have uh, uh, to counter North Korea's threat, the deterrence by uh, denial or sort of deterrence by punishment. Right, I see. Now, Dr. Go, one more question to you. Mm. Uh, President Yoon Sagir is pushing on with stronger rhetoric than mm. ever right now. And on the West Sea Defense mm. Day, he warned that his administration will make North Korea mm. pay the prices mm. for its reckless provocations mm. and vow to strengthen South Korea's mm. uh, military capabilities. Mm. What are your thoughts on this hawkish stance and how is it affecting tensions on the peninsula? Well, the, the reason why the president is engaged in this hawkish statement is because the dovish uh, action by South Korea didn't have our intended mm. impact. Uh, we know with the previous uh, administration of President Moon Jae-in, clearly the President Moon was uh, much more conciliatory towards right. Pyongyang mm -hmm. and tried to engage Kim Jong-un uh, in order to ensure stability in the peninsula, which was a very noble effort by the former president. But then the uh, the answer by North Korea was uh, quite uh, provocative and even violent. We know that the North Koreans, uh, North Korean response to the some you know propaganda leaflets uh, sent from by South Korean activists from the southern uh, southern side to North Korea was the, the blowing up of the joint nations office back in 2020. Mm -hmm. So there was a disproportionate violent response by North Korea against uh, South Korea, despite the fact that South Korea had a very conciliatory uh, posture towards the North. So, so it's clear that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, conciliatory gestures only doesn't really uh, help South mm -hmm. Korea to achieve stability in our relationship with North Korea. Mm -hmm. So uh, the best way is to remind North Koreans that uh, if they want stability, then they should behave that way. So in a way, North Koreans are uh, in a very self-defeating uh, course right now because 
the reason why they have to face very hawkish uh, South Korean administration right now is because, because of their misbehavior of the mm -hmm. past. Right. Now, Mr. Klinger, since we are running out of time, I think this will be our last question, but uh, South Korea's hawkish stance has resulted in enhanced ties between South Korea and Japan as well. And South Korea's unification minister had discussions with top Japanese government officials last Friday, and they have reportedly proposed the creation of a consultative channel. Now, regarding such boost in bilateral ties, what significance does this have, and how is North Korea uh, reacting to and viewing this? situation? Well, President Yun took a very bold, even politically risky move in, in reaching out to Japan to resolve uh, some issues in, uh, of the past. As, but uh, it's a way of trying to improve South Korea's national security. Uh, the U.S. and South Korea cannot de defend the Korean Peninsula without the assistance of Japan, not only the seven U.N. command rear bases uh, that the U.S. And, and U.N. sending states would need access to, but also Japanese capabilities like missile defense, anti-submarine warfare, mine clearing, et cetera. So it's in South Korea's interest to have good relations with Tokyo. If there were a crisis, and we know that North Korea has threatened nuclear attacks against Japanese cities, if relations are, are bad between Tokyo and Seoul, then a Japanese prime minister say, why should I risk nuclear attacks on my citizens and my cities uh, for, on behalf of a country that they have poor relations with? And last year, the, the leaders of the three countries uh, pledged to uh, improve or uh, to develop near real time or real time exchange of information on North Korean missiles. And that uh, is in all of our interests. So, so far, South Korea has refused to integrate its missile defense system into that of the, the allied system. Uh, over the, the historic differences. And, and that's like a, a baseball coach telling his three outfielders, don't talk to each other, even though you're more likely to drop the ball or, or not intercept the missile. So uh, I think it's, it's a very good development. We hope that uh, Japan does more to reciprocate, uh, to enable the, the further improving of relations as well as military cooperation and coordination. Right, I, I I cannot agree more. Now, I'd like to ask more questions to our experts, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Now, thank you, Dr. Go and Mr. Clare for your insights. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, thank you. Now, this is all for Within the Frame tonight. We will be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.